bills and the debts and all that. But of course then uh, he got this patroness, Margaret Taylor, you know, and she helped us more than anybody. Without her, I don't know. I don't know what we've done, because she, she bought us various houses, put us up also in Oxford in a little studio place in the grounds and so on. He was quite prepared to pay the price to these patronesses. If they wanted to go to bed with him, he was going to do it. Dylan said, I'm terribly worried about money. How about giving me a contract? Oh, I said, I don't suppose there's any contract you would keep, except perhaps one you wrote yourself. And I pushed the menu across to him and said, write your own contract, and I'll see if the BBC can back it. All right, he said, and this is what he wrote. Clause one, ten pounds a week to be paid direct to Caitlin for the groceries. Clause two, must live in Wales. Clause three, must come to London two days a month for a piss-up. Clause four, don't pay me anything till I've written it. He said, that's one I'll keep. And I believe he would have, but I could never persuade the BBC to take it seriously. During the Second World War, between 1940 and 1945, Thomas was a scriptwriter for Strand Films. It was the only job he could get. He didn't want to join the army and kill people. He wrote documentaries about the home front, and he wrote poems about the effect of the war, like Among Those Killed in the Dawn Raid was a man aged 100. He wrote that one on a scrap of paper in 10 minutes in a cutting room. It was these poems, collected together in Deaths and Entrances in February 1946, that finally made his reputation. These were poems that were not just experiments with words, they were about something. And they went down very well with the literati who hung out in a square mile behind me, between Regent Street and Broadcasting House. Among those killed in the dawn raid was a man aged 100. When the morning was waking over the war, he put on his clothes and stepped out and he died. The locks yawned loose and a blast blew them wide. He dropped where he loved on the burst pavement stone and the funeral grains of the slaughtered floor. Tell his street on its back he stopped the sun and the craters of his eyes grew spring shoots and fire when all the keys shot from the locks and rang. Thomas was relieved of the need to register as a conscientious objector because he was classed C3 as a physical specimen. When the war began, he and Kathleen had been married for two years. During the war, they had their second child, Aronwy, and lived an existence financially precarious and unsettled, half in London and the home counties, half in Wales. The first time I met him was in Swansea during the Blitz. I remember him reciting Milton in a pub, and people who had never heard of Milton listened with awe and begged him to go on. For some reason, the uniform absolutely infuriated. John Pritchard told me that he was walking past the Swiss, was it, one time, and Dylan came rolling out through the blackout doors. And Kathleen came after him and she said to John, if only Dylan would just once pick on a little man. Uniform infuriated him. <laughs> My mother and father led a nomadic life. I went and sponged on different people at different times, but it wasn't considered sponging, it was considered they would enjoy him. And they went down very well with the literati who hung out in a square mile behind me between Regent Street and Broadcasting House. Stalking a dead writer can be a cumbersome business, sifting through the evidence, accounts written or recorded at the time, recollected in tranquility decades later, each witness with their own take. In the case of Dylan Thomas, does anyone have the whole story and does any of this help us to understand his work? You see, he was such a good poet and he liked to behave like a bad one. And he was such an ethical man and he liked to appear totally unrespectable. With Dylan? 
Dan Jones said Dylan preferred lies. He liked lies because they were more interesting. He thought the truth was very often very dull. But more people were, were, were draining his energy and draining in his cash, you know, because he didn't have much, but he spent, his, spent it when he had it. A lot of people would like to have a continual party for their life um, without the consequences. And just to read about my father and to imagine him having a continual party and producing great works, it's, it's nearly as good as doing it themselves. He gave a great feeling of both health and unhealth, of someone who was ruining himself, whose teeth were gone, who couldn't eat breakfast, who had awful sort of hangover pains, talked about pain and joy, and of health of a marvelous, captivating energy. So it never occurred to one that he was burning himself to pieces exactly. I think he did compartmentalize his friends. I know sometimes I've come out of the <clears throat> six bells at Chelsea with Dylan, and this is a long time ago, of course, when he was about 20, and some friends of his were walking on the other side of the road, and he would leave me and go and talk to them. There's only one thing on which they all agree. He was always true to his own sense of himself as a poet. What is it about this man that provokes such disparate testimonies? Did any one of them really understand him? There's no question that the person who was most central to the contradictions in his life was his wife. Kathleen McNamara was born in London of Irish parents, with a background altogether different from Thomas. She was brought up in the country, in Hampshire, among art and artists. They met in the Wheatsheaf pub in London in 1936, shortly after the publication of his second volume, 25 Poems. He was the bohemian poet, she was the poet's girl. There he was, talking away as usual. Yes, he kind of fell all over me, you know, and put his head on my knee and never stopped talking. And uh, it seems almost immediately that we kind of fell into bed together. It all happened so naturally, as though we'd known each other all the time. Kathleen and Dylan Thomas are one of the great literary love affairs of all time. The irony is he wrote hardly any love poems to her. The most important one, originally entitled Poem to Kathleen, was called I make this in a warring absence. And it's basically a poem about a row. Couldn't live with her, couldn't live without her. It's also, and this is a point we can't make too many times, incredibly obscure and difficult to understand. His friend, Vernon Watkins, said it took him three weeks to write the third verse alone and three or four days to change the last line of that verse from proud as a mule's womb and huge as insects to proud as a supped stone and huge as sand grains. Was this three days well spent? But deliberate density of syntax was a Thomas trademark long before he met Catlin.